as you've heard by now, we have a, an institute called the Performance Science Institute to teach high performance mindset in any domain. And we have Dr. Glenn Fox, a neuroscientist who leads that here. Many of you are in his class on Monday evenings. Uh, and those two classes work together. So part of my personal reason for starting this institute was I constantly feel like I'm not performing at my best. I just constantly struggle with am I sort of like maximizing my, my potential, my abilities. I used to be really smart. I sort of get that feeling of like, geez, when I was in grad school, I could remember everything. I could read a case. I could digest it. And now I don't retain things like I used to. So I was like, how can I like improve my brain? And one person's name just keeps coming up around town, not just around town, but around the world. You heard it last week when Ty said it, but you know, friends in YPO, friends in entertainment, they're all like, you should get Jim Quick for your class. You should get Jim Quick for your class. You know, he works for some of the, you know, the best companies and entrepreneurs in the world, Fortune 50 companies, and it, you know, is paid to do that, so we're really lucky that he uh, is here. I'm a fan of his, not just his work, but his mission to serve others and help others. And when he heard about our class, he insisted on coming here. So I'm just really excited to welcome, let's give a USC welcome to Jim Quick. How's everyone doing? Doing well? Yes, like this. Um, my, uh, what I want to do is I want this to be a different kind of class. I want this for you, this to be the most valuable class session you've ever had. And I know that's saying a whole lot. And it's not because I'm so great, it's I believe that you are so great. And so, um, and th is the volume okay in the back there? You can hear me okay? So what I'm gonna talk about is how to make you, how we could become collectively twice as smart. How many people here like to be twice as intelligent? <laughs> right, basically I wanna show you how you could double your brain power. Uh, so effectively you could read twice as fast, your focus could be double, you could remember twice as much. I mean, effectively learn anything in half the time, any subject or any quick skill. How many people would find that valuable? A little bit or a lot? A lot. And so here's the thing. Um, I am going to do this in a way that's a little, little bit different. Um, I'm going to show you how to hack your brain. They say we use a very small percentage of that potential. What, what, what percentage of your brain do they say we use? Yeah, like Einstein said like 10%. I, I read um, Stanford later, it said about 2%. I read recently it's one ten thousandth of 1%. It keeps on going down. Um, but actually, in actuality, I feel like we use all our brain, but some of us use it more efficiently than others. Can you, people relate to that? And so what I'm gonna do is show you some hacks to be able to get more out of it, where you don't have to say have to work harder, but you're just working smarter. So I have no, uh, no set presentation. And so what I'd rather do is, I know sometimes some, you'll, um, you'll learn something and at the end you'll ask questions. I would actually rather start by saying, um, asking you a question, like what would, what would make this extremely valuable for you? If we're gonna spend the next 75 minutes together or so, and I was a magical genie and I could snap my fingers and help you to be able to, your focus, your habits, your mindset, your concentration, your ability to read, uh, your ability to recall things, uh, what, what topics do you think would be really interesting and useful for the majority of the people here? And then we'll go from there. Yes? To read and retain good stuff. To read and retain. How many people here have too much to read, too little time? How many people have books on your shelf you haven't read yet? Right? And it's hard, right? How many people get more than 10 emails a day? Right? We're drowning in information, but we're starving for, for wisdom. Right? And so we live in this information age. I was doing a program. Um, I, I remember hearing that from the chairman of Google, that the amount of information that's been created from the dawn of humanity to the year 2003, just think about it, like a decade and a half ago, that amount of information, that data, how long does it take to be able to create that now? That, that wealth, that volume? Two days, every 48 hours. You think about all the podcasts and the YouTube videos, social media, blogs, and so on, every two days. So the amount of information is doubling at dizzying speeds, but let me ask you a question. How we read it, has that changed at all? how we re focus on it, retain it. So the amount of information is going like this. This gap creates what? Stress, right? Anxiety, they call it information fatigue syndrome. You're gonna hear a lot about this. It's a compression of leisure time, more sleeplessness, right? Higher blood pressure, or even if you have time to enjoy yourself, you can't enjoy it because your mind's still like multitasking. Um, so reading faster, so we, we could talk about that. What else would be useful for you? Yes? To be able to focus. 
How many people have ever, um, going back to studying, you're studying a page in a, in a book, you get to the end, and you just forget what you just read? And you go back, and you reread it, and you get to the end, and you still don't know what you just read, right? How many people's minds wander? So we're going to talk about how do you maintain your concentration in a world full of uh, distraction. What else? If we, could cover, we could definitely cover this. Reading speed and focus. Remembering names. How many people have ever met some, is it important to remember names? Have you ever met somebody, you get their name, and then seconds later after the handshake breaks, the name just falls right to the floor, and you wonder where it goes? Or if it's not a short-term issue, it's a long-term issue. Like you could be out and about, somebody taps you on your shoulder, you turn around, you see somebody you recognize, but for the life of you, you honestly don't remember who that person is. And what makes it worse is when you have to introduce two people, or, that, or what makes it really worse is when that person has the audacity to remember your name. Right? And then it gets really awkward. Or you have to introduce two people whose names you don't remember and it gets very awkward. Was it, I don't, you ever watch Seinfeld? Wasn't there a Seinfeld episode on this? Like he was dating somebody for a while and he forgot her name and every time she went to the bathroom he would try to go into the, her purse and see her ID and, and George and Kramer would come by and try to introduce themselves and get the name out. They play all these games. I think it, what was it? It rhymed with a part of the female anatomy? Right. So, um, so it's it, names, names and faces. Um, we'll cover that. What else? Yes. Um, how do your mind control, your control your emotions. Like uh, your emotional state, like how you feel about certain things or anxiety. Yeah. It's tough, right? How many people feel like you know you want to be logical sometimes, but you get your 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 mind gets hijacked by your heart sometimes. Right? Especially the emotions that get in the way of you learning, like anxiety and stress. Because when you go into fight or flight, you go, uh, what happens is, um, I just did a whole pod, I don't know if anyone listens to my show, it's, it's the number one training show on iTunes in the world. It's called Quick Brain. So you just look at your app and just search Jim Quick. And there's nothing sold there, there's no sponsors or anything. It's just 10 minute episodes on how to read a book a week, how to learn another language, how to be able to remember people's names, that kind of thing. But we did a whole thing on emotional states because when you're stressed, you create cortisol and adrenaline, which is really good for fight or flight, but it's not good if you need to study. It's not good if you need to give a presentation in front of a group of people. And so we'll talk about learning states. Um, that's a lot to cover. Is there anything else that's really burning for somebody, like you know, something you're struggling with, something you'd like to be able to fix that's really holding you back from being the, the, the person you'd like to be here? Yeah. Okay, so how many people can relate to this? It's like, you don't study in school, because what are you doing the night before? You're what? You're like cramming, right? And then the next morning, you, like, you, you don't study, and then all of a sudden you're studying all night, the next morning at breakfast, nobody can talk to you because you don't want anything to spill out of your brain. And you can't wait to take the test. And when you take the test, what happens afterwards? It's like gone, right? So everybody knows there's a learning curve. But what a lot of people don't realize is there's also a forgetting curve that within 48 hours, this is what the research is showing, within 48 hours of learning something once, 80% of it is gone within two days. Isn't that crazy? And you might be concerned, like, how do you learn new things built on like, prior knowledge, right? We could talk about that. All right, so I'm going to go through. Um, so this is great, because it's good that I didn't prepare a, a set presentation. And I'm going to hit all these points for you in the time. How many people will find that this is incredibly valuable if we could really move the needle in those areas for you? Would that make things better? OK, and the reason I ask is not because I don't know the answer. It's just this active is really important. You'll find that one of the keys to learning faster is participation, in meaning being active. Because learning, here's what you want to remember. And I, I love the format of this class where people are sharing their, their big takeaways and their ahas and in terms of what the big things you take away. I want to make sure that everybody has something that's just, you have it. I, I call these quickenings. My last name really is Quick. I didn't change it to do what I do. Um, it's my father's name, my grandfather's name. You could say my life and my, my destiny was pretty much planned out. I had to, I had to be a runner back in school, um, which is a lot of pressure when it says quick right on your, on your shirt. Um, I have to be very careful driving because the worst name to have on your driver's license when you get pulled over for speeding is the name quick because you're not going to talk your way out of that ticket. And um, I get to do my mission, which is helping people to learn faster. And the reason why I find that that we can together collectively boost your intelligence almost 100%, like double your brain power, is not because I'm so great, it's because you're so great. 
It's just you weren't taught how to do this. I always think it's kind of interesting when you look back at school, a lot of, um, especially when you think about high school, elementary school, and junior high, middle school, a lot of classes on what to learn, right? Math, important classes, math, history, science, Spanish, all classes on what to learn. But how many classes were there on how to learn? Like how to think, how to focus, how to concentrate, how to really listen, how to study, right? How to read faster, the kind of things that you want to know that would make your life easier, right? How to remember things. I always thought it should have been the uh, fourth R in school. They teach you three R's in school. What are the three R's? Reading, writing, and what? Arithmetic, right? The fourth R, what about remembering, right? What about recall? What about retention, right? Socrates says there is no learning without remembering. And you know this because if you forgot half of everything you know, how effective would you be? If you forgot half the people, half the words, half of everything that you studied, but what if you could double that amount? So that's what we're going to talk about here. So I'm going to share with you. I'm going to go through this rapid fire. You'll want to take notes um, as best you can because I want to give you a, like a whole download. Basically, over the next 60 minutes, get you to the point where you will be able to double your brain power when you leave here today. Now, the key here is this. I'm going to customize it around, around you be able to learn. How many people have a subject or skill you'd like to learn faster? Can you think of one right now in your mind? Like, I want you to just think about a subject that you're having a challenge in or something you really want to master. It could be marketing, it could be Mandarin, it could be music, it could be martial arts. Think about a subject or skill, because I want to make this extremely, extremely practical. So here's what I want you to remember. Now, when I, um, see, the reason why I know you can learn how to do this is because a lot of people don't know, I, um, I grew up with learning challenges. Okay, and I don't share this a lot, but at the age of five, I had a very bad accident, uh, head trauma, brain injury, and I had learning difficulties. I was put in very special classes. Uh, teachers would have to repeat themselves five, six, seven times to me, and I still wouldn't understand. I would pretend I understood, but I didn't really understand. I had very poor focus. I had a very bad memory. Um, it took me an extra four years to learn how to read, and it was really hard. You think about school where you're passing around. Remember you used to pass around that book and you had to read out loud? And when that book got closer and closer and closer, I would get so nervous. I think actually a lot of people who have a fear of public speaking, that's where it actually came from, right? Because that was a learned association that we have, right? I read, I read recently that uh, the fear of public speaking is actually the number one fear in, in this country. Number two is fire. Number three is death. It's crazy, right? So really, when you're thinking about it, some, you know, if somebody's at a funeral or something, somebody would rather be like in the casket than actually giving the eulogy, right? Because people are so scared of public speaking. But I think the reason why people are so scared is they're scared they're going to forget what they need to say, right? And so I teach a lot of the TEDsters how to be able to memorize their speeches. A lot of actors, uh, you know, from Jim Carrey to Will Smith, be able to teach them how to memorize their lines here in Hollywood because it's such a valuable skill, right? Because I believe two of the most costly words in business or I forgot. You know, I forgot to do it. I forgot that conversation I had with that person. I forgot that client information. I forgot what I needed to say. I forgot that meeting. I forgot where I put it. I forgot that person's name. Every time you hear yourself say those words, you know, you lose time, you lose opportunity, you lose credibility, right? And so I know, like, after compensating, I learned all these ways to compensate, and now I teach these to individuals, but I know you have genius inside of you, right? So I'm going to show you how to activate that other 90% of the potential. So what I want you to remember, though, is if you want to learn, here's what I, what I believe, that genius leaves clues. Genius leaves clues. That when somebody does something extraordinary, that you could see them do something extraordinary in any field, whether it's art, architecture, it could be mathematics, it could be fashion, whatever it is, and you could leave, or you could say, wow, that person's amazing. How do they do that? Because there's always a method behind the magic. When you see magic in the world, there's always a method, but it's usually unconscious. So I'm going to pull the, 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 the curtain, if you will, and show you what people are doing inside their mind that allows them to get these incredible results. When someone can learn a language faster than somebody else, when people could read you know, a book. You know, I've been reading a book a week now. Sorry, I've been reading a book a day for over four years. You know, everybody could do these kind of things because you weren't taught how to do it, though. right? And so. One of the ways that besides reading and research is when you're role modeling genius is who are the fastest learners on the planet? Who are the fastest learners? Children, right? How fast can children learn a musical instrument compared to an adult? 
How fast can a child learn another language compared to an adult, right? I did this, uh, I actually I was in a group, of, an audience of 10,000 people from 60 countries. I said, who are the fastest learners on the planet? The whole table here yelled out pygmies, which I don't know. If, if you know why they're so, such fast learners, please tell me. But children learn fast, right? And part of it is they're so playful, right? Children ask lots of questions. They, they have a sense of wonderment, right? There's a Rumi quote that says, sell your cleverness for bewilderment. Sell your cleverness for bewilderment. Like, when's the last time you felt bewildered about something? So children learn so well because they play and they get involved in things. But the challenge is when we grow older, we stop playing, right? We, when we grow older, we stop playing. And I don't think that's true. I think it's actually the opposite. I think we grow older because we stop playing, right? That we grow older because we stop playing. So how many people are willing to, to play a little bit here to learn faster? Raise your hand. All right, stand up real quick. Let's, let's prove it. Find somebody you don't know in the room and just partner with somebody in the room, ideally you do not know. Introduce yourself, go, go, go. Raise your hand if you need a partner. Raise your hand if you need a partner. Raise your hand if you need a partner, go around. Raise your hand if you need a partner and look for somebody else raising their hand. Partner up. Repeat after me. All right. This is what we're going to do, okay? We're going we're gonna to wake up your brains because it's the end of the day, and we're going to do this little exercise because I believe Oliver Wendell Holmes says this, says that once a person's mind is stretched by a new idea, it never regains its original dimensions. So I want you to be able to think differently. And what where it starts with is in your body. When you move, when your body moves, your brain grooves. When your body moves, your brain grooves. All right, there's a connection between your brain and your body. There was actually a study done at Oxford University saying jugglers actually have bigger brains. Raise your hand if you know how to juggle. These people have very, very big brains. Right? So you actually create more white matter. You have, jugglers learning how to juggle actually creates more white matter in your brain. And so as your body moves, your brain grew. So I'm going to get you to think differently as opposed to just saying think differently. We're going to do it with our partners. So what we're going to do, Lauren, how are you? I'm put you on the spot. Um, we're going to do this. We're going to do very, very simple. We're going to count to three, right, with our partner. We're going to go one, two, three, and then alternate back to one. Ready? One, two, three. One, two, three. All right, go with your partner. Go. One, two, three. Yeah. Two, three. All right, we're going to do it again. Stay with me. All right, shh. Very good. Now what we're going to do is this. Now we're going to take levels of difficulty. Now with the number one, we're going to replace the one with a clap. All right, so watch this. Why wait, not yet. Don't start yet. Don't start. Three. Two. Three. Go, go, go. This would be a nice picture, a picture. This would be a nice picture at the next one. The next, in, in, in like two more from here. All right. Shh, shh, shh. All right. So when I go shh, you repeat after me. Shh. Very nice. Now, one is you're going to remain a clap, but now you're going to stack number two. Two is going to be the sound of an animal. Okay, so watch this. <laughs> Three. Kaka. All right, go, go, go. What animal is that? Okay. The next one you want to take a picture of. Or the next one you want to take a picture of. Okay. Shh. Very nice, very nice. Now, finally, we keep one and two the way, you know, keep those stacked. The third one is. Uh, I don't know, some kind of dance, like the twist. How do you do the twist? <laughs> All right, so wa watch this. So start with, start with one. Take a one. So watch this. Ka -ka. All right. Ka -ka. All right, go, 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 go with your partner.
All right, all right. High five your partner, have a seat. High five your partner, have a seat. Okay. Can you turn my volume up a little bit? Okay. This is the, uh, this is the lesson. We're going to talk about this. All learning is state dependent. All learning is state dependent. If you walk away with anything out of this session today, remember this. If you want to know the key to a long-term memory, do this. Repeat after me. In do this. Information, Information. combined with emotion Information. becomes a long-term memory. One more time. Information, Information. combined with emotion Information. becomes a long-term memory. And you know this because you are a memory expert. You know how many of you, you could hear a song and it could take you back years. Raise your hand automatically, right, without you thinking about it. How many people, it, it could be a song, but it could also be a, a fragrance. You could smell something and it could take you back. What about it's a food? How many people, for you, it's a food? There's a certain food that will take you back to when you were a child, right? Because the information alone is not memorable. Information combined with emotion becomes a long-term memory, especially when you understand the brain anatomy part. But going back to this, when it comes to emotion, what was the primary, when you think about school in the past, like think about high school, what was the primary emotion you felt back in high school? <laughs> Say depression. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you feel primarily? Can, okay, yeah, half the class was bored, the other half the class was confused, right? But bored, right? Boredom usually. And so here's the thing, information combined with emotion becomes a long-term memory. Boredom, on a scale of 0 to 10, what's that? 0. What's anything times zero? 0? And you wonder why you forget. Like if I ask you about the presidents, I ask you about like the periodic table, all the things that you learned back in school, what's your retention of that information? It's probably very little because of the state that you learned it in. Does that make sense? Okay, so you need to be able to up the state. And so part of what we do by moving around and we kind of laugh about it and move our bodies a little bit is we change the, the, the tone of it. Right? Because emotion is created by motion and moving around. Emotion is created by motion. So for example, let me prove it to you. Sit the way you'd be sitting right now if you're completely fascinated and interested in every word I was saying. Sit, sit exactly the way you'd be. Now why do you even have to move? <laughs> because here's the thing. You know your physiology affects your psychology. That you can control the way you feel. It's not up. You know why I love this class? Because you're elite. Right? You are exceptional because you self-selected to be here. Right? You're what I call a thermostat. You're not a thermometer. Because you want to be a thermostat. You don't want to be a thermometer. What's a thermometer on the wall do? What's the primary function of a thermometer? It, yeah, it just reacts to the what? To the environment. Right? Are people sometimes the same way? They just kind of react. They react to the weather. or They react how people are treating them. They react how the, the economy is doing. Right? Now, there's a difference between a thermometer and a thermostat. What's a thermostat do? It controls the environment, right? It influences the environment. It sets a goal. It sets a standard. It sets a vision. And what happens to the environment? It rises. It raises to be able to meet that. And that's what leadership really is, right? It's about taking the invisible and making it what? Visible. So when you think about what you want to learn faster, and my promise is to you is to be able to give enough brain hacks to double your brain power, to be able to supercharge your intelligence, I want you to remember this. Be fast. Write this down. Be fast. It's an acronym. The B is believe. Because if you believe you can or believe you can, either way, what? You're right. Who said that? Henry Ford. Henry Ford, right? Henry Ford said that. If you believe you can or believe you can't, either way, you're right. Now, what's a belief? Actually, let me show you what a belief is. Stand back up, quick. Make a arm length distance from the person next to you. I know it's going to be tight, but just try to make some distance from the person next to you. Even the wall behind you, try to move around a little bit. I know. You guys got it. All right, put your arms down. Now, what I want you to do is this. I just want you to jump up and down a little bit. Shake out your body. Stop. Notice where your feet are. And what I want you to do is just point forward with your right hand. With your other right hand. OK, good. All right, so right hand. And what I want you to do is that without moving your feet, I want you to go clockwise to your right as far as you could turn and notice where you're pointing comfortably. 
Turn as far as you go as you take your neighbor's eye out. And notice where you're pointing comfortably. Notice the point that you're pointing at exactly. Got it? Come back center. Let me show you what a belief is. Put your arm down. Put your arms by your side. Take a deep breath. Exhale. And close your eyes. I'm going to walk you through a quick visualization exercise I do with athletes. With your arms by your side, breathe normally. And I want you to imagine now, just imagine you're raising your arm again. And this time, I want you to imagine you're turning twice as far as you did the first time. See and feel in your body turning twice as far as you did the first time. Getting a great stretch. And again, with your eyes closed, I want you to imagine, see and feel yourself turning three times as far. What does that feel like in your body? Just imagine it. And some of you are thinking, I can't imagine it. If you can't imagine it, imagine you could imagine it. Imagine you're turning three times around. And then one more time with a smile on your face, thinking, what does this have to do with speed reading? See and feel yourself turning four times around in your body, getting the best stretch of your life. What does that feel like? See and feel yourself turning one, two, three, four times around. All right, open your eyes. Point forward with your right hand. And turn to your right now as far as you can now go. Whoa. All right, come back. Clap if you went further the second time. And have a seat, have a seat, have a seat. Now, here's my question for you. The magic question, the obvious question for you is this. Were you physically capable of turning that far the first time? Yes, right? Like nobody took a yoga class when my eyes were closed, right? You're able to, where was the limitation if there was one? In your mind. And you're like, well, Jim, I didn't have a belief on how far I could turn. How many beliefs do you have? How many beliefs do you think you have? Yeah, millions, countless beliefs, right? But here's the thing. We don't, we're not conscious of those beliefs, right? But here's what you want to do and understand that everything, there's a success formula I subscribe to. I believe it's this. Be, do, have, share in that sequence because the syntax is very important here. Be, do, have, share. Now, it's kind of interesting because some people try to reverse engineer this or, or actually like put something that's later, something former, right? Like somebody could, uh, somebody, you've heard this before, right? Where somebody wins the lottery, all of a sudden they're at the have stage and they have millions of dollars. What happens after years? What happens to their, to their financial situation? Right, it's all gone, right? Because they, they, they were given, or they have millions of dollars, but it, starting with the B, they were never a millionaire. Does that make sense? Right, so they never had to be able to do those things, so it went back to that thermostat. Does that make sense? Now, in order to be, do, have, share, in order to have anything to share with the world, you need to be able to do something. Is that true? Right, because it's not just the law of attraction, it's the law of action, right? You're taking action on things. And so, in order to be able to do something, you need a belief that allows you to do that behavior, okay? So for example, if for somebody, let's say that they have trouble remembering names, and I teach you how to remember names, which I'm gonna show you exactly how I remember people's names, if you have a belief, a sense of certainty around this idea that you're not good with names, what's gonna happen? You're not gonna remember. I remember um, I was preparing to run a marathon, and I was reading this book on training, and one of the chapters was on the psychology of running a marathon. And it said, one of the, it said this verbatim, because I'm, I'm a memory expert. It said this, <laughs> your brain is a supercomputer, and your self-talk is the program it will run. So if you tell yourself you're not good at remembering names, you will not remember the name of the next person you meet because you program your supercomputer not to. Does that make sense? Because here's the thing, a lot of times people go and they say, they come to me and say, Jim, I'm too old, or this runs in my family, or I'm just not smart enough, or I have a horrible memory. But I always tell people, if you fight for your limitations, you get to keep them, right? If you fight for your limitations, you get to keep them. If you argue for your limits, they're yours, right? And so you always wanted to monitor, you always wanted to monitor your self-talk, always. Always monitor your self-talk, because here's why. Your mind is always eavesdropping on your self-talk. Your mind is always eavesdropping on your self-talk. And you know, when I, when I was nine years old, right, I had this injury, this, this brain injury. When I was nine years old, I remember in class, 
the, this, this changed my life uh, for the worse. Or it's hard to judge it now because it, you know, kind of, you know, it's an inflection point that puts you on a path because sometimes your struggles become your strengths, right? Because my inspiration really was my desperation. How many people can relate to that? That that's going through desperate times actually led, like a, I believe that a breakdown could lead to a breakthrough, right? You hear a lot about post-traumatic stress, post-traumatic stress disorder. What you don't hear a lot about is post-traumatic growth, right? A lot of people who've been through adversity, the most difficult time of their life, and they've come through it, and they wouldn't wish those, that situation on anybody, and yet they, find, they found value in it. They found a gift in it, right? They found a deeper meaning. They found a mission. They found some kind of strength from it that they wouldn't have had outside of that. And so post-traumatic growth, but going about my, my trauma with this brain injury, I remember I was in class, and a, a teacher pointed to me, talking to another adult, said, that's the boy with the broken brain. Wow, right? Remember? And here's the thing with, with, with people, like, how many people um, interact with kids, children? How many people was once a kid? It's, it, this is what it is. You have to be very careful because your external voice becomes their internal voice. You know what I mean? And that became my internal voice all through school. Like I was the boy with the broken brain. And anytime I didn't get something right, I would say, oh, it's because my brain is broken. You see how I kind of default for that? But here's why you want to monitor your belief. A lot of you went 25, how many people you went, raise your hand if you feel like you went like 25% further, right? 25, 50% further, and here's the thing. You could go 25, 50% 25, further in your health, in your relationships, right? In your, in your grades, right? But it's having that belief that says you can do it. Because here's what you always want to remember. All behavior is belief driven. All behavior is belief driven. In order to do a new behavior, you need an empowering belief that allows you to do those, that behavior. And so when we do this visualization exercise, it's not just limited to to students, right? I do this with, with executives. I do this with athletes a lot. What did, um, I'll give you an example. What did Roger Bannister do in 1954? What is he famous for? The four minute mile, right? Throughout human history, nobody can run a mile in less than four minutes, right? And how was he able to do it? It wasn't just physical training, he would do mental training, right? He would visualize inside of his mind just like you were visualizing how much further you could go, he would visualize himself crossing the finish line, looking at the clock, and it said 359. Because he knows what you know, that success is an inside out process. Here's the thing, it's not you'll believe it when you see it. It's you'll see it when you believe it. Does that make sense? You, you'll, yeah, you, when you actually see it, when you believe it in here, because all behavior is belief driven. So he was able to do it because he saw 359 in his mind, then he was able to do it out here, right? And that's what entrepreneurs do, right? Entrepreneurs solve big problems, they create new value because they have this vision for what they want to create in their mind, and then it becomes external, right? Inside out process. Be, do, have, share. So you have to be that before you be able to do it to be able to have it. Now here's what I find interesting. I didn't find it interesting that he broke the four minute mile by visualizing. What I found interesting is what happened after that. Throughout human history, nobody can run a mile in less than four minutes. One person does it, what happens after that? Yeah, everyone starts running a four minute mile. Dozens of people start doing it in the next couple years. Now let me ask you a question. Was there big advancements in shoe technology and nutritional support and training methodology? No, what was the change? A change in belief. Because you know what the belief was back then? The belief was the human heart couldn't sustain a sub four minute mile so it would explode in your chest. Now, if you believe that, would that keep you from running a, four, a sub four minute mile? Like that would keep me from jogging, right? Nobody would do anything <laughs> because if it, like no one would do anything because all behavior is belief driven, right? Then all of a sudden one person does it, then everybody starts to do it, right? And that's the power of a belief. Like I'm here because years ago, I, um, when I was growing up, when I was about nine years old, I remember going to a family reunion, a bunch of us uh, went out for dinner, and it was about 25 of us, busy Saturday night at a restaurant, and the waitress came and started taking everyone's order. And when she got to me about halfway through, I noticed something funny. She wasn't writing it down. Have you ever had a, like, a waiter or waitress like this? And I'm thinking like, and I'm nine years old, I'm naturally very skeptical, right? Because I'm, I'm the broken brain, I think nothing's working, and I'm just thinking, you know, all this stuff. And, and, but when she came back, she got every single thing perfect. 
I mean like the, the, what we wanted to drink, the salad dressings, the appetizers, how we wanted the meal cooked, like our desserts, every single thing perfect. Now is that a standout skill or a standout, is that a standout skill in business? Yes or yes? Right, because it's hard to be able to stand out and make it really easy, yes or yes, I know it's the end of the day. But it's like, we, it's a standout skill in business, right? Because people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Like just, if you want, just own that, right? Especially when it comes to names, right? How are you gonna show somebody you're gonna care for their business, their future, your, their finances, their health, their family, whatever it is you have to offer them if you don't care enough just to remember them, right? And before you sell anything, what do you sell? Yourself, right? And so that's why you wanna be able to remember these things. So, so after I saw that and she came back, she was my Roger Bannister. Does that make sense? She did something I never thought was possible and opened up the possibility like, wow, what else is possible? Somebody could do that. Because here's what you want to remember. S genius leaves clues. That if somebody is a genius in any area, you could get similar results by finding out how they do it. Let me give you an example. Um, let's play a quick game together. I want you to, let's as a group, let's, um, somebody uh, before we started here asked me, um, before we got started, about numbers. How many, uh, let me ask you a question, to be real. When, when you were a kid, how many phone numbers did you know? Uh, okay, a lot, right? How many phone numbers do you know right now? <laughs> Honestly. How many people have a number you call all the time? Literally, text or call all the time. And you honestly, if your phone was dead or you didn't have it with you, you honestly do not know what that number is, <laughs> right? You know what they call that? They call it digital dementia. Digital dementia, this is a new term in healthcare. Basically, it's like our phone's keeping our to-do list, our schedules, it's doing simple math. I was out with a group of people, it was 10 of us, I swear to God, 10 of us, and then when the bill came, three people took out their phones to divide the bill by 10. <laughs> and, and if you laugh, the people who aren't laughing are thinking, yeah, why wouldn't you do that, right? Because here's the thing, we're outsourcing our brains to our smart devices, and your brain is like a muscle. It's use it or what? lose it, right? But if I put my arm in a sling for six months, would it stay the same? Would it even grow, would it grow stronger, stay the same? What would happen? It would atrophy, it would grow weaker, and that's what's, a lot, that's what's happening to our minds, right? You feel that, right? If I ask, like, nobody wants to memorize 500 phone numbers, but we've lost the ability just to remember one. How many people can relate? If I gave you a seven digit number, or 10 digit number, how many people honestly would have trouble remembering that number? Right, because we've lost that potential. We, we forget passcodes, we forget all these different things. And so here's, here's let, watch this, let's, let's play a game together. Let's try to collectively try to remember a, a, a number, right? Let's, uh, instead of like 200 plus numbers, let's collectively just come up with one number, we all write the same number down, right? And just for time's sake, so just raise your hand, instead of doing single digits, let's do uh, two digit numbers. So just raise your hand and say 27. In fact, let's say 27 is the first one. Write down, everyone writes 27. And I'll repeat the number, and let's do the best we can to memorize this list. This will be a nice brain training exercise for all of us. So 27, so everyone writes 27. So raise your hand, yes. 94. 94, so everyone writes what? 94, we got it. Yes, back center. 13. 13. 13. Yes, sir. 21, blackjack. Is this all the, all the volunteers? If we're having trouble coming up with numbers, <laughs> we have to go in a totally different direction with, with, with this class. Yes? 50. 50. 5-0. Yes? 88. Next one is 88. Yes? 31. Bingo. Yes. 75. 75. How many single digits is, uh, is that, by the way, just to get an idea? What's that? 16 digits, wow. That's, that's at least, what, two numbers, right? Okay, let's do, let's do a couple more. Yes, back there. 47. 47, okay, yes, 12. 12, 
How many single digits are we at now? 20? OK, let's do a few more. Let's, let's see, see, see how many we can do here. Yes? What's that? 39. Number 39. Yes? 19. Number 19. Yes? 69. What'd you say? Yes, back there. 23? Number 23. And all the way in the back. 10? 10. How many single digits are we at now? You're like a lot. <laughs> this number's getting really big. 30? All right, let's stop there. Now, how would you go about memorizing this list? This, this long number, how would, you go about, how would you go about memorizing it? <laughs> Chunking? Let's, so, let's see how many, actually, let me, let me see if I can, I, sh I should have actually memorized this while we're doing it. Um, cover your pages in the front row here. Let me see if I could, let me see if I can remember these 30 digits. Um, wait, I need some encouragement here. <laughs> All right, I'll do single digits, ready? Two, seven. Nine, four, how are we doing so far? Yeah. One, three, two, one, five, zero, eight, eight, good. Three, one, seven, five, seven, ooh, no. That was, that was so good. Four, seven? Yes, whoa. One, two, three, nine, is that right? One, nine, six, nine, two, three, one, zero. Now, I honestly, I don't do this to impress you. I do this to express to you what's possible, just like what this, this waitress did for me, right? She remembered everybody's order, and all of a sudden, I was like, wow, what else is possible? She was my Roger Bannister. Like, backwards. Well, maybe. Someone said back. Well, like, what? How many people like to see me do this backwards? <laughs> I need some energy here. Yeah. All right, ready? Um, actually, let me try this. Zero, one, three, two, nine, six, nine, one, nine, three, two, one. How are we doing? Yeah. Seven, four, five, seven, one, three, eight, eight, zero, five, one, two, three, one. Get it mic'd up again. It's never happened before. Okay, so I am I'm actually, uh, yeah, there's, um, I'm actually putting a card game together after this if, if anyone wants to, wants to play some cards. Um, all kidding aside, all kidding aside, so I will, um, the truth is, if you come up to me, if we happen to see each other like, like in the neighborhood or whatever, um, and just like, hey, do you, I, I was in that class, do you remember that list? Like even three weeks from now, I, I will literally go two, seven, nine, four, one, three, two, one, five, zero, eight, eight, and so on. Because here's the thing, when you understand how your memory works, you can work your memory. When you understand how your brain works, you could work your brain, right? And so the truth is, every single one of you could do this. We just weren't taught how to do this, all right? If anything, we were taught a lie that somehow our intelligence, our potential, our memory is somehow fixed like our shoe size. But really what this is about, it, the essence of what we're talking about here is about transcending. Transcending. Ending the trance. That's what transcendence is for me, ending this trance. Ending this mass hypnosis that somehow you know we're limited. Somehow, like something is fixed, right? That our that our powers are something that we're not as strong and capable as we are. That we're not enough, 
right? So I want people, my thing is because I taught myself, I couldn't read growing up as a kid, I told you. I taught myself how to read by reading comic books late at night. And something about the comic books, about superheroes brought the words to life. How many people like kind of geek out over superhero movies and like, you know, Avengers and X-Men and Wonder Woman and, and Black Panther? Like, so that, that was like, those are things I just enjoyed so much because for me, it was about like these heroes, and I'm not talking about superpowers like leaping tall buildings and shooting lasers out of your eyes. I'm talking about real life superpowers, right? It's like you finding your unique uh, strength, right? Your unique ability, your talent. But just having a superpower, does that make you a superhero? What do you have to do? You have to use that power for, for good, right? To be able to contribute to community, to be, able to, to be able to create a business, to be able to scale it for impact. So it's not just about income, it's about impacts. It's not about making a dollar, because anyone can make a dollar, but it's about making a difference also as well, right? And so what we're talking about here, this exercise I do, I don't do this to impress you, I'm doing it to more express to you, impress upon you what's possible. So let me show you how to do this. How many people want to know how to do that kind of thing? Towards names, towards you, what, how many people would love to do that towards what you're studying, right? And be able to have that for the rest of your life. But here's what you want to write down. There is no such thing as a good or bad memory. Write this down. There is no such thing as a good or bad memory. There's just a trained memory and an untrained memory. There is no such thing as a good or bad memory. There's just a trained memory and an untrained memory. And you know what the key is here is because, you know, one of the things that I like to do that makes things doable, when I remember I said genius leaves clues, for me, if, if people want to be more creative or they want focus, it's not about having focus. It's about doing focus. You don't have creativity, you do creativity. You don't have a memory, you do a memory. And a lot of what I teach is about taking things that are, you feel like are, is, is a noun, like something you have, like focus, and turning it into a verb. Because when you turn it into a verb, what happens? What? Yeah, it gives you some, it's a process, right? It's a recipe, it's something you could do. And so I'm going to show you, I'm going to move kind of the curtain apart. I'm going to show you what people are doing inside their mind. And it makes it look like where they're having focus, right? Or they're having creativity or having great grades. Exactly how you do it step by step. But the first part is you have to believe, all right? So the B in be fast stands for believe. If you believe you can or believe you can't, either way you're right, all behavior is belief driven. The E in be fast stands for exercise. Exercise, and I don't mean physical exercise, although it's across the board. All the research says people who are more physically active, when you are more physically active, you will do better on cognitive tests. You'll have better focus, right? You'll have better concentration. You'll have a better memory. Especially, basically, any, to make this very simplified, anything good for your heart is going to be good for your head. What's good for your heart is going to be good for your head, right? So more blood flow, more oxygen to your brain. For those of you who feel like, how many people feel like you have mental fatigue, right? Brain fog. One of the best ways of curing that brain fog is just deep diaphragmic breathing. Remember, remember I said sit, let me test you again. Sit the way you'd be sitting right now if you're totally engaged with what I was saying. And don't get lazy on this. You're like, sit the way you'd be sitting, right? Because a lot of you get more energy, you sit up. Because here's what you do, because you don't like have fatigue, you do fatigue. Does that make sense? You don't have brain fog, you do brain fog. And so part of it is when you're slumped over, you collapse the lower third of your lungs, and the lower one third of your lungs absorbs two thirds of the oxygen. Is oxygen important for your brain? Yes or yes, right? And that's why a lot of people get tired. So this is about like peak performance, right? Elite mental performance. And if you want to learn under best conditions, put yourself in the best condition, right? So the E is exercise. And I don't mean physical exercise though, I mean practice. Right, because I'm going to teach you skills that, that you'll have for the rest of your life. The ability to, to read faster, you know why reading faster is so important? It's because they say upwards of four to five hours a day is spe spent every day processing information. Now for here in, in an academic setting, I know it's more than that. Yes or yes? Right, you have to spend at least four or five hours a day studying or reading, right? You know, in the workplace certainly also. Think about all the emails and business plans and books, magazines, periodicals, blogs. All this reading, right? And here's the thing, if you have to read four hours a day, if I could just show you how to double your reading speed, and you could save two hours a day, two hours a day, what would you do with two hours a day? 
right? Two hours a day. Let me show you what's, what's two hours a day over the course of a year? All right, get out your phones. <laughs> what's, uh, what's one hour a day over the course of a year? Let's be very conservative. 365 hours. Now, that's a pretty big number, so let's break it down. How many 365 hours, how many 40-hour work weeks is that? Nine. Over nine weeks of productivity. Two months of productivity, you get back saving one hour a day on something ubiquitous like reading, right? And so the reason why I do so much training at General Electric and Nike and so on is if, if an employee is spending four or five hours a day reading, that means half of their salary is being paid just to read. Does that make sense? And, how, and that's the biggest line item, right? It's human capital, it's payroll. And so that's why that efficiency is so important, especially for your own life, right? But when I go back to this exercise, I mean practice, because I'm going to teach you how to turn, create new habits. One of the most popular episodes of our podcast was how to create new habits. The, the second most popular episode that we've ever published is my morning routine. Like I, there are 12 things I do every single morning to be able to jumpstart my brain. How many people want to jumpstart your brain first thing in the morning, right? And that's the thing, because here's what you want to remember. If you want to win the day, you have to win the first hour. If you want to win the day, you have to win the first hour of the day, right? Because there's something called the science of momentum, right? So you want to start. And I'll tell you the thing that, okay, so we talked about digital dementia. I think there are three supervillains. We talk about superheroes. There are three supervillains that are robbing you right now. That it wasn't like it was previous generations, right? Three digital supervillains. Number one is digital overload. Too much to learn, too little time. You're taking, how many people feel like you're taking a sip of water out of a fire hose? with all the studying you need to be able to do, and you're drowning in it, right? Too much information, too little time. Digital overloads, one. Digital dementia, we already talked about. That's the idea where we're outsourcing our brains to our smart devices, and our brains are basically making us stupid. Like, our smart devices are basically making us stupid, right? So I was talking to this brain doctor. He was saying, GPS, if you're looking for a third-party piece of technology to tell you when and where to turn, you're not getting early detection of things like dementia because you're not realizing when you would have memory lapses, so you're not going to doctors get checked out. Does that make sense? This is, this is this thing called digital dementia. And then the third digital villain is digital distraction. You're talking about focus, right? You want to improve your focus? Like, where's your focus nowadays? We live in a world full of distractions. And I'll tell you the, one of the best brain hacks, and you're going you're gonna to say, like, Jim, you're interesting up to this point. Now I hate you. This is what's going to happen. But as your coach, as your brain coach, because people have a... You know, they have a, a voice coach, they have a business coach, a personal trainer. I want to be your brain coach, right? The worst habit you could have is to pick up your phone the first hour of the day. Raise your hand if you pick up your phone the first hour of the day. Look around. It is the worst habit you could have when it comes to high performance. And let me tell you why, okay? The most successful people in the world, they have a to-do list, yes? All the things you need to be able to do and accomplish. The people who are the elite, the 10% of those people, I noticed, they also have a not to-do list, right? It's even more important. Even that list sometimes is even bigger than their to-do list, right? Because they are very clear of things they will not do because it wastes energy, it wastes focus, it wastes... You know what one of the things, like one of the things on that list? Multitasking. Multitasking. How many people like to multitask, do multiple things at once? Now, in actuality, all the research is absolutely clear. There is no such thing as multitasking. Multitasking does not work. Two, now, you could walk and chew gum and have a conversation. I'm talking about doing two cognitive activities, all right? Because in actuality, you're not multitasking. In actuality, the correct term is task switching. You're going from one task to another, but you're getting this novelty dopamine fix, and you feel like you're getting, you're getting stimulated and then not like the novelty, and you feel like you're being more productive, but you're being busy. Because here's what happens. Every single time you switch from one activity to another, it takes anywhere from five minutes to 20 minutes to reset your focus and your flow. Does that make sense? They do these studies with doctors and surgeons. They found that when they multitask, actually increases the rate of um, error rate. So they're making more mistakes. So not only are you wasting time, but you're making more errors also on top of it. So multitasking is on that not to-do list. But the other thing on that list, when you put this on the list, you'll see big, big changes, I promise you is not pick up your phone the first hour of the day. Now, I'll tell you why. It's because we are rewiring our brains to be distracted. I'll tell you the two things that we're rewiring our brains when you pick up the phone first thing in the morning. 
You're training your brain to be, uh, to be distracted, right? Like um, we, we interviewed Dr. BJ Fogg at Stanford University, who runs the Influence Lab. One of his students actually co-created, co-founded um, Instagram. So that's all about habits and making things addictive, right? Now think about it, opening up Instagram 100, what's the average, 150 times a day, right? And if you're not doing it 150 times a day, somebody's doing it a, a lot more, right? Which is really scary, but that's addictive, right? Because every time you see a like, a share, a comment, you get this dopamine rush, and that runs along the pathways of your motivation and your learning. So you're literally learning to be motivated by, by being triggered like that. So if that's the first thing you're picking up every in the, in the morning, you know, shares, comments, likes, cat videos, or whatever it is, then your attention is being pulled everywhere, and you're training your brain to be distracted, and you wonder why you can't concentrate. You know, they, it's, you see this on Facebook all the time, that, that our, our attention span is less than a goldfish right now. That's what they're saying. The goldfish is, is nine seconds, and, and our attention human span is about, on average, eight seconds. After eight seconds, our attention goes somewhere else. So here's the thing, whether that's true or not, we get the idea of where things are going. Don't pick up your phone, because it's training you to be distracted. I'll tell you the second thing it's training you to do, it's rewiring your brain for, it's training you to be reactive. All right, not just distracted, it's training you to be reactive. Meaning, how many, how many entrepreneurs or future entrepreneurs are in the room? Raise, raise your hand, founders. Now here's the thing, like, and I'm just asking, I'm just gonna get a sense of this. When you wanna create a business, right, and you have a vision for where things are going, you can't be reacting to everything in the environment. Because what you're doing is, when you wake up first thing in the morning, you go through, you cycle through brainwave states. And I'm not gonna go through all of them, but basically, right now everybody here is in beta. That's the awake state. Delta is when you're asleep. In between are two critical states. One is called theta, and one is called alpha. Theta is the state of creativity. So when Einstein was doing all these thought experiments, he would flow in and out of the state right, right above sleep. Right? He, would, he would actually be in his rocking chair at Princeton holding a rock in his hand, and he would do these thought experiments, visualizing himself on a beam of light. And you know, luckily, he has the left brain you know, science and be able to math and formulas to be able to turn it into something. But he did this right brain's creativity, these, these thought experiments. But why would he hold the rock? Why would he hold a rock? Because if he fell asleep, he would what? He would drop in and wake up because he didn't want to go to delta. Does that make sense? So he wanted to stay in theta. So theta, theta is the state of creativity. You know what puts you in theta? Showers. When you take a shower, how many people when you're taking a shower, you, get, you come up with all these ideas in your mind, right? You get inspired. You come up with, it's always when you can't write stuff down, right? You come up with all these ideas, and that's when you come up, you're brilliant, right? I, I actually took six showers before I got here today just to be on for you guys. So here's the thing, like showers put you in a theta state. But that alpha state between theta and beta is the state they call relaxed awareness. Relaxed awareness. This is the state where you just absorb information. It's a hypnotic state that you're in when you meditate. This is the state that you're in of high performance a lot when you get into zone. For example, have you ever, have you ever been talking to somebody who's watching television and they're in a trance? They're watching sports or they're watching whatever their favorite show is and they honestly don't hear you. Like they're so, they're hypnot, they're in hypnosis, right? That's an alpha state. TV puts you into an alpha state. It's where your conscious mind is set aside and you just absorb information unfiltered, right? So we train people on how to learn languages, how to learn school material by training them to get into an alpha state, right? This relaxed state of awareness where you just start absorbing information like languages or foreign, like facts and figures and all that kind of information. Now, you are highly suggestible. So if you're in an alpha state when you first wake up in the morning, alpha theta, and you pick up your phone, you're highly suggestible. It's rewiring your brain to be reactive. Meaning, if you look at a text message, a voice message, you know, your, and your emails, and you have all these things, people wanting stuff fr from you, right? You have to fight all these fires. My, my friend Brendan uh, says that an inbox is nothing but a convenient organizational system for other people's agenda for your life. Yeah, that, that hits home, right? So why on earth, if you're a visionary, right, you want to you create your, your day, you want to win the day, like why would you look at everybody else's agenda, all the fires you need to fight, and go be in reactive mode? How are you going to be proactive, right? So what I do is I have three things that I need to do every single day, personally, and three things I need to do professionally, and that's it, right? Because I look at my to-do list, how many people are familiar with Pareto's principle? Oh, wow. Okay, so... This is the 80-20 rule. So how many people are familiar with the 80-20 rule, right? 20% of your efforts yield you 80% of the rewards. 
Now, this has been proven across the board in health, in marketing, in business. 20% of your customers give you 80% of the income, right? 20% of your customers also give you 80% of the headaches, right? So you're always top grading, right? Your employees and so on. So 20%. So you always want to focus on that 20% that gives you the big return, right? And so when, we're, when I'm looking at my to-do list, I'm looking for the three things that are going to move the needle the most, right? The things, the dominoes, if you will, that are towards the beginning, not towards the end. That, um, one of my very favorite books of all time was a mentor of mine, Dr. Stephen Covey. He wrote a book called what? Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. If you have not re read it, read this book. All right? Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. These are the habits of some of the hi most highly effective, productive people in the world. Seven habits. And the seventh habit is sharpen the saw. Sharpen the saw. Remember this. If you have all this wood that you need to cut, and you're given like a, a saw, but it has a dull blade, when would you want to sharpen that saw? Do you want to spend all this time suffering and struggling and sweating trying to cut wood with a dull blade? When would you sharpen it? In the beginning, right? right? So they say that the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time to plant a tree is when? Today, right now. And so that's why we teach accelerated learning, because if there's one skill to master in the 21st century, it's your ability to learn faster. I'm, t I'm, not, I'm not kidding. Meta-learning. Learning how to learn is the most valuable skill, in my opinion, because that makes all the other skills and subject after that easier. Does that make sense? That if I was a magical genie and I could say, you know, I, I grant you one wish. If, if I granted you one wish, what's the obvious thing to wish for? More wishes, right? That's the hack, right? But if I was your learning genie and I said I could help you learn any subject, any skill, master it, literally, and you get one, what do you pick? Learning how to learn. Because then you could apply it towards any subject, right? Coding, Spanish, anything, right? So that's what you want to do because the only constant is change. I, I, I heard somewhere recently that graduates right now, they're going to have anywhere from eight to 10 different careers. Not jobs, but careers. Because the world is changing so fast. Nobody knows where we're going to be five, 10 years ago. But I could, you could predict based on trends where things are going, you know, there's three A's in the, that, are, that are affecting us. Three A's, right? AI, automation, and Asia, right? So, <laughs> like, think about it. Like, all jobs are being, like, think about what AI is going to be able to do in terms of artificial intelligence when it comes to things like, simple things like taxes are coming up, bookkeeping, right? Or automation, things that be um, automated. Right, you dumb through machines and computers, or outsource to a third world country, right? So the three superpowers that I would focus on for you are your, these, these superpowers of learning, right? Superpowers of imagination, of creativity, of strategy. These are things that, that computers aren't going to be able to catch up in, a, in a, quite a while. So that's what you want to be able to double down on emotional intelligence, right? On empathy, on bedside manners when it comes to doctors, things that machines can't do. Because so, really, the future belongs to the creatives. Right? Left brain is logical. What's your left brain? Logical, words, sounds. What's your right brain? If your left brain's logical, your right brain's what? Illogical. <laughs> what? It's imagination. It's creativity, right? It's visualization. It's emotion, right? And that's an oversimplification. But I'll tell you, the best readers, they're not left brain. You might think, like, if, you, if someone's hooked up to brain sensing device, they might, for most people, it'd be a left brain process. Words, language, sounds. But on the right side, though, the best readers tend to be more right brain because they don't just hear the words, they experience the words. Does that make sense? All right. But going back, all the way back here, going back to the power of exercise, I mean practice. Because there is no magic pill, but there's a magic process. Don't look for the magic pill, look for the magic process. Right? Turn it into a verb. And what I'm saying here is this, practice makes what? Progress. Practice makes progress, right? There's, no, there's never a level of perfection because there's always another level, right? And so what I'm saying here is be fast. The E stands for exercise, which is practice. Now, fast. The F in fast. If you want to learn any subject or skill faster, I want you to forget. And you're like, Jim, you just did this whole thing on memory. Why are you talking about forgetting? Going back to like getting rid of old information, right? If your cup is full, it's really hard to learn new information. Does that make sense? So you kind of temporarily forget what you already know about a subject so you can put new information in. Here's what you want to remember. Your mind is like a parachute. It only works when it's what? 
when it's opened, right? But when I think about this, I think about this, beginner's mind. Beginner's mind. That's, that's what I mean about forgetting. Pretend, pretend you're a beginner. So that's what you want to forget. Actually, forget three things. Forget what you know about a subject so you can learn something faster. The second thing I would say, forget about situational things. We already proven you can't multitask. But what I mean by that is, if you're thinking about four different things outside this room, that literally leaves you 25% of your potential to be here to learn. And you're not going to learn faster if you're only using 25% of your presence and your resources. Does that make sense? And I'm not saying, what I'm saying to do is this, don't fight it. Don't fight it, just write it down. This is tactical. If you're thinking about other things that are going on outside this room, just write it down. Because here's what you want to remember. What you resist persists. What you resist persists. Let me show you a perfect example. Raise your hand up straight up. Raise your hand straight up. Take your other hand, put it straight up. Right? And with your dominant hand, I want you to push. Push into, push, push, push your the other hand. Push. Push harder. Push harder, 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 harder. Now, now watch this. As you're doing this, this makes an interesting photo. As you're doing this, why, do, why doesn't your hand just fall down? Did I, did I ever say push back? No, put your arms down. Because what you resist pre persists. Right? Does that make sense? And so if I ask you to don't think of a big pink elephant. Whatever you do, don't think of a big pink elephant in front of this room. Pink polka dot elephant. What are you going to do? You're going to think about it because your mind can't process a negative. Your mind can't process a negative. That's why we always do affirmations in the positive. It's not something you don't want. It's something you want because your mind can't process a negative, right? Because it has to think about what you don't want to in order to be able to do it, right? And so what you resist persists. So don't try to think about, not think about everything going on. Just write it down so you know it's there, and then you can focus, right? The third thing that you want to forget are your limitations. And we already covered that, limiting beliefs. Limiting beliefs. Because if you believe you can, and believe you can, either way you're right. But here, here's what you want to remember. You know who has a really good memory? Elephants, right? What animal? Elephants. You ever notice the elephant, like, the elephant at the circus, and you wonder why it's tied to this rope to the stake in the ground, and you wonder why it just doesn't like leave. Because it's an elephant, right? It is incredibly strong. It's incredibly huge. We could pull down the whole circus tent, but why doesn't it? Because since that elephant's been born, it's been tied to that same rope with the same stake in the ground. And when it was first born, it would try to get its freedom. It wants its sovereignty, right? It would pull, 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 and it would struggle for days, maybe a week or so. But after a week or so, what happens? It learns something. It learns it's helpless. And in psychology, it's called learned helplessness. Because what happens over time? That elephant gets big and strong, right? And it's physically capable of escaping, but it's not mentally capable. Does that make sense? Because all behavior is belief driven. So don't be an elephant. Like, don't be that elephant, right? So we, you know, because you're thinking about what does it have to do with reading? What does that have to do with your memory? Think about like you believe with how smart you are. Do people have a belief on how far they could turn? Do people have a belief how much how much they're worth financially? Yes or yes. They're going to set that thermostat, and the environment's going to reflect that. So you want to forget about your limitations temporarily. The A in fast and B fast stands for active, active. And what I mean by this is this. If you're struggling right now, it's because we all, we've all had this 20th century education. And a 20th century education prepared us for a 20th century world, which at the turn of the century is working in farms and factories. And that's what a lot of the education system was, was, was tailored to, right? It's one size fits all, sit quietly, you know, by yourself, don't talk to your neighbor, and so on. Now it's changed, it has changed, but the world's changed a lot faster. Is that fair? Like we live, I, I get to do a lot of training for, uh, for like SpaceX, and I, I posted a picture recently, you know, with Elon and everyone in the audience there, and I trained some of the most amazing brains. But like, think about Elon, right? It's he, in his world, we, we live in an age of electric cars and spaceships that are going to Mars. But our vehicle of choice that we choose when it comes to learning is like a horse and carriage. Do you feel that? Do you feel like you're falling behind more and more and more that you can't keep up? Like, how do you get ahead in this world when you feel like you're falling behind? And so one of the reasons why is you don't want to be passive. Like you don't want to just sit there and consume information. The human brain does not learn based on consumption. Your brain learns through creation. The human brain does not learn based on consumption. It learns through 
creation and co-creation. And so you want to be active. So for example, how can you be more active when you're learning? Just shout, just shout it out. How can you be more active in your learning process? Participate, like how? Take notes, right? By the way, a really fun way of taking notes, um, they did a study and they wanted to find out the best and worst ways of taking notes. And what was, by the way, what, what do you think the worst way of taking notes was? Oh yeah, okay, good. Uh, yeah, actually I did a whole thing on note taking digital versus, um, versus handwritten, and 100% people do better on handwritten tests. Now by the way, I'm not handwritten notes on the test. Uh, out of curiosity, would you guess one reason why? Yeah, because it gets you to focus. Because you can't write as fast as somebody can, can, can speak, right? So you have to, to self-select and filter the information, qualify the information, and only write the things that are most valuable. But the worst way of taking notes, actually, was pure dictation, word for word. That was the worst way. The people who were tested that did it was verbatim did the worst on the test. But one of the best ways of taking notes was through key words and key ideas, right? Mind mapping and such. And so a fun way of taking notes that I do that works really effective, that's whole brain, is I take a piece of paper, I put a line down the page. On the left side, I capture notes. On the right side, I create notes. Now, let me, let me specify for this. On the left side, I'm, I'm writing down how to remember names, how to read faster, how to give a speech without notes, step by step, right? On the right side, I'm not capturing, I'm creating. I'm writing my impressions of what I'm capturing. Does that make sense? What, like the things I'm, questions I have about what I'm capturing. How I'm going to use this and apply this in the future. How I'm going to teach it to somebody else. How it relates to what I know, right? So because if my mind wanders, right brain wandering, imagination, creativity, i rather it wander on the right side. Another way of saying instead of capture, create, on the left side, I'm note taking. On the right side, I'm note making. You see the difference? Okay, so active, right? You ask questions and so on. So you be more active in the process. Here's what you want to remember, and you can write this down. Learning is not a spectator sport. Learning, like life, is not a spectator sport. How many people believe what you put in is what you get out of something? Because you take responsibility for it, right? And this is the thing, because it's not the teacher's job Really, it's not. It's your responsibility to be able to do that. And when you take responsibility, then you can make the positive change. I posted this picture um, on social media recently. Um, a picture Recently, I got to introduce two of my modern day superheroes together. And I, I dropped names, not for the purpose of dropping names. I dropped them because I want you to remember the lesson. So next time you see these people on the news, or you read about them, it reminds you of the lesson. Does that make sense? So I got to introduce two people for dinner who wanted to meet each other. It was Stan Lee and Richard Branson. Now, now get, watch this. Stan Lee, not Stan Lee. Stan Lee. Who's Stan Lee? Marvel, right? He co-created who? Spider-Man, X-Men, Fantastic Four, Avengers, Black Panther, all these amazing, like, my heroes, right? And we're in the car, and I asked him, like, Stan, you created all these incredible superheroes. Who's your favorite? Like, I, I need to know. Like, and he's like, Jim, it's Iron Man. I'm like, how many Iron Man? Fans, like Robert Downey Jr. loved the movie and stuff. And I was like, that's great. He's like, Stan, he stands like, Jim, who's your favorite superhero? And you'll see his picture on Instagram. He has a picture of uh, Spider-Man on his tie. And I was like, it's Spider-Man. And without, I said, I Spider-Man. He said, without a pause, he goes, Jim, with great power comes great responsibility. Now, how, about, how do you, every single one of you know that, right? And you don't even remember. It's like you're in your DNA, right? The hero's journey, right? Joseph Campbell's work, it's like there, right? And I have dyslexia. I have this learning challenges, you know, head injury, all this stuff. And I remember, like, I reverse everything automatically. And that's one of my challenges. And so I, I was like, Stan, you're right. With great power comes great responsibility. And I said, the opposite is also true. With great responsibility comes great power. Yeah, that's worth writing down. With great responsibility comes great power. That when we take responsibility for something, we have great power to make things better. Does that make sense? But here's the thing. And this is what I noticed with entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs have values, certain values that we all have values, right? But a high value on that hierarchy is uh, freedom. How many people here love their freedom? How many people here want to do what you want, when you want, with who you want, for as long as you want, wherever you want? How many people like that, right? And that's, your, that's what you want to do with your business. And you have this, th this idea and this, this myth that, that, you know, like it's like being an entrepreneur is just like this incredible, Thing where she's have ultimate freedom and it's just like no responsibilities and everything. Now, in actuality, though, 
a lot of them actually move away from responsibility and discipline, right? They don't want to have to do something because that's the opposite of freedom. That's a jail. But here's what I notice. If you can't get yourself to do the things you need to do, whatever that is, then that's a prison. Because in actuality, discipline equals freedom, right? That when you're disciplined, it gives you the freedom and the responsibility to be able to do the things. Because if you don't take responsibility for something, the ability to respond, responsibility, then you can't do anything. Then you're a thermometer again, right? As opposed to owning you being a thermostat and you could affect things out positively, right? And so my thing here is when you're taking, when I'm talking about active, is to be active because it's not the expert in front of the room, right? It's you. You take the responsibility and then you get the benefit. And when you responsibility, that takes me to the S and B fast. The S and B fast is state. State, and I, I'm saying this because it came up in terms of how people feel about something. And I think if there's one thing to take responsibility for, if there's one thing, be responsible for how you feel. Does that make sense? Because all learning is state dependent. All learning is state dependent. And so don't be at the effect. Be, don't be a thermometer, be a thermostat. So right now what you could do on a scale of zero to 10, how do you feel? Like check in with yourself right now. How do you feel on a scale of zero to 10? You have a certain thing? Now, whatever it is, if I ask you to just up it two, if it was a seven, make it a nine. If it was a five, make it a seven. Can you do that? Yes or yes? yes. All right, do it right now. Do it. Take yourself two levels up. Notice in order to do that, you had to do one of two things. You had to do something with your body or you had to do something with your brain. Yes or yes? You got to move your physiology or affect your psychology, right? Because your attitude affects your what? Altitude. Your attitude affects your altitude. So you always want to monitor your state because all learning is state dependent. The last T, the last letter in fast, be fast, is teach. And this is the big, I think this is a big one, right? That you learn. If you want to learn a subject or skill in half the time, Learn it with the intention to teach it to somebody else. Like right now, I'm going to teach you a couple of hacks to be able to read faster. I want you to learn it as if you're going to teach it to someone very specific. Does everybody have someone in mind that you wish was sitting here right now, that you wish was auditing the class? Does everyone have somebody? I want you to think about that person and take the responsibility to learn what you're about to learn right now, everything you've taken notes on, to teach it to that person. Is that fair? Because here's the thing, which you, see, I, I remember hearing this thing in, like saying, um, those who can't do what? Teach. I never thought it was a negative. Like I heard it, maybe just because I, I was organized, but I always said, yeah, if I can't do something, teach it, and then I could do it. Does that make sense? Because here's what you want to remember. When you teach something, you get to learn it twice. When you teach something, you get to learn it twice. So you learn with the intent to teach, because intent matters. Intent matters. All right, I'm going to give you these hacks very fast when it comes to reading because I want you to just be able to go out there and do it. I'm going to show you a hack that will improve your reading speed 25, 50%. Some of you will be 100%. You'll double your reading speed, right? Raise your hand if you want to be able to do that right now. What are the rest? Do the rest of you don't want to learn how to be able to read faster? <laughs> so here's, here's the thing there are a number of things that keep you reading slow. I'm going to tell you what a couple of them are. And then I'm going to give you one solution, all right? And then you can subscribe to a podcast and listen to more of them. But here's what you want here's what you do. No, no, because in terms of time, like I want to be able to be respectful of your time. So here's, here's what it is. There are a few obstacles to effective reading, right? There's two parts to reading. There's reading speed and there's reading what? Comprehension. And it doesn't make sense to have one without the other. Is that true? Now, traditional speed reading will teach you to skim, scan, skip words, get the gist of what you read. Now, my, my clients run countries and companies, and, and they're doctors. They're like, like, you don't want your doctor to get the gist of what she's reading. <laughs> I promise, promise you that, right? And so there are some things that keep you from reading better, right? There's two speeds. There's, there's, there's two things, speed and comprehension. So one of them, obstacle effective reading, is lack of education, right? Are, let me ask you a simple question. Are you born with the ability to read? No. No, nobody was born and started like, reading magazines in the, in the waiting room, right? You're taught. But let me ask you a question. When's the last time you were taught how to read? When's the last time you took a class called reading? Not, not a college lit class, a class called reading. How old were you? 
seven years old, six, seven years old, let me ask you a question. Has the difficulty and the demand increased a little bit since you were seven? A little bit or a lot? Is it fair to say you're still reading it the same way you learned it? Yes, that's the problem, all right? So the second obstacle effective reading, and I'll bring this up because you brought it up, is lack of focus. Lack of focus is a big one, right? How many people you can't concentrate on what you need to read? Big problem because you're wired for distraction. Here's, here's a lie or a myth that's being spread around, a rumor, if you will. And I think this is a rumor being spread around by really slow readers. Um, it's this. If I ask you to read faster, what do you think will happen to your comprehension? You think it'll go down, right? Now, in actuality, it'll go up. You know, see, we have, so we publish, online, we publish an online speed reading course, memory course, academic success program, like how to study, right? Uh, focus program. And so we have students in over 180 countries. So we have a lot of data. And we found that the fastest readers actually have the best comprehension. Do you know why? Because they have the best focus. Watch this. Like, your brain is this incredible supercomputer. It is magnificent, right? But when you read, you feed this supercomputer one word at a time. Metaphorically, you're starving your mind. And if, here's the thing. If you don't give your brain the stimulus it needs, it'll seek entertainment elsewhere in the form of distraction. Does that make sense? You're reading so slow that you're not stimulating your brain enough, so it's seeking entertainment elsewhere in the form of wine, mind wandering, right? Watch, watch this. If you're driving, going 15, 20 miles an hour, are you really focused, honestly, on the act of driving? No, right? What are you doing? Everything else, right? Like I saw somebody the other day putting makeup on and shaving and reading a newspaper. Like you could be thinking about the dry. You could be thinking about eight different things, having conversations, trying to text. You could be doing five things when you're going slow, right? But let's say you're racing cars and you're doing straightaways, 200 miles an hour, right? Do you have more or less focus? A little bit or a lot? Are you thinking about like what you're doing Saturday and trying to text and to, no, what are you doing? What's your focus? On exactly what's in front of you, right? Same thing with reading. People who read faster tend to have better comprehension because they're not distracted because they're fulfilling their, their need, their entertainment, if you will, right? Because when I started to speak slow, what did your mind naturally start to do? Wander. You start thinking of other things. You start getting easily distracted. If I kept on talking like that, you would fall asleep. Tell me those aren't the same exact symptoms you have when you're reading. Your mind wanders, you get distracted, you fall asleep, right? How many actually, how many people actually use reading as a sedative? Like you use it to fall asleep. You have like a token book by your bed that you've been reading for like an embarrassing long period of time. <laughs> Remember, information combined with what? Emotion becomes a long-term memory. If you're connecting sleeping with reading, that's the wrong association. Do you get that? All right, so here's the thing. I'm going to teach you how to hack your reading, but if you believe, remember all behavior is belief-driven, that, that if you read faster, your comprehension will go down, you're not going to do it. Does that make sense? But I'll show you the third obstacle to effective reading. This is the big one. This really is the third obstacle to effective reading, and it's not focus. It's called sub-vocalization. Sub-vocalization. What is it, right? What's sub-vocalization? Speaking. How many people notice... When you're reading something, you hear that inner voice inside your head. You hear that inner voice when you're reading? Hopefully it's your own voice. <laughs> it's not like somebody else's voice. The reason why it keeps you reading slow is if you have to say all the words in order to understand them, you could only read as fast as you could speak. Is that crazy? That means your reading speed is limited to your talking speed and not your thinking speed. Isn't that nuts? But here's the question. Do you have to pronounce words like New York City or computer to understand what those things are? No. No more than you would have to pronounce a stop sign when you see a stop sign on the side of the road. But do you comprehend it exactly? You understand it, right? No more than you would have to pronounce punctuation marks like comma, exclamation mark, question marks. You don't have to pronounce those things. So why are you pronouncing and, there, because, this, that? You don't have to say it in order to understand it. And the best readers, they don't do that. Let me give you one hack to be able to overcome some of these obstacles. One of them is using a visual pacer when you read. A visual pacer is a pen, a highlighter, a mouse on a computer, your finger while you read. Here's what you want to remember. 
If you want greater speed, use your finger while you read. If you time yourself to read 60 seconds, count the number of lines you read in a book, time yourself to read using your finger, just underlining, not skipping anything, uh, just underlining the words, 60 seconds, count the number of lines the second time, that second number will be a lift of 25, 50%, some of you 100%. Now let me tell you why, because as adults you want to know why certain things are the way that they are. Number one, children do it. All children use their finger while they read until they're taught not to. Secondly, you do it. You're like, Jim, I don't use my finger when I read. When I ask you to count the number of lines when you read, what will 100% of you do? One, two, three, four, five. You use a visual pacer. Third reason you use your finger while you read is because your eyes are attracted to motion, right? That if, that if something ran across this room, you wouldn't look at me because as a hunter-gatherer, you need to pay attention to what moves in your environment. You're, you're a hunter-gatherer in a bush, and you're hunting lunch, right? A rabbit or carrot, whatever your, your diet is. If the, book, if the bush next to you moves, you have to look at what moves because it's your survival, right? Number one, it could be lunch. Number two, you could be lunch, right? You have to look at what moves, right? So when your finger's going through the page, your attention's being pulled through the information as opposed to your attention being pulled apart. But the fourth reason you use your finger while you read is because it's how your neurology is set up, your nervous system, right? Your brain, your spine, your senses, certain senses work really closely together. So for example, um, have you ever tasted a great piece of fruit? Like not something that's been waxed and sprayed in the supermarket, but like something that right off the vine, right from the farmer's market, have you ever tasted a great tasting peach before? Now in actuality, you're not tasting that peach. In actuality, you're smelling the peach. But your sense of smell and taste are so closely linked that your mind doesn't know the difference. You know the difference when you're sick, because when you can't breathe out of your nose, what does food taste like? Nothing. It tastes bland, right? Just as your sense of smell and taste are so closely linked, so is your sense of sight and your sense of touch. If there was a toddler right here, I take out my keys. I said, look at my keys, look at my keys, look at my keys. What's the child going to do? Show me. Reach out and touch. Because in order to see, he or she needs to feel like he, they're touching it, right? When people read with their finger, they tell me all the time. They feel more in touch with their reading. Let me, another example. If somebody loses their sense of sight, how do they read? Braille, right? Touch. Use your finger while you read. If you're on greater speed, use your finger while you read. I'll share, share this with you. Um, Remember I told you that I had learning difficulties when I was, when I was a child? I taught myself how to read by reading comic books. Um, recently, I got to do a training um, up the road um, in Los Angeles for the chairman of 20th Century Fox. And it was for the chairman CEO. And we spent like half the morning training his board on how to do these things, speed read, memory, and so on. And here's the thing. Afterwards, the, the CEO, he walks me around and says, thank you so much. This is the best training ever. He walks me around the, the film lot, and I saw this movie poster of, of Wolverine. And I was like, I made a comment saying, I can't wait for that movie to come out. Um, I can't wait for this movie to come out. And he's, he's like, he picks up the phone, and five minutes later, I'm in the Fox Theater watching Hugh Jackman fight all these super ninjas. I mean, it was like the coolest thing ever, right, on a Friday. When I was done, the chairman asked me, uh, Jim, how was the movie? I was like, wow, this is really good. It's like, you don't know this, but as a kid, I had this brain injury. I couldn't read. I taught myself to read by reading comic books. My favorite comic was Wolverine and the X-Men. How many X-Men fans are here, right? And it wasn't because the X-Men were the strongest. It's just they didn't fit in, right? They were the mutants, right? They were the outcasts because I felt like I didn't fit in growing up, right? The boy is a broken brain. But the highlight was when I was reading the comic books was the school, the X-Men school, Professor X's school for the gifted was where? in Westchester, New York. And that's where I grew up. It's the suburb of New York City. And I remember thinking, like, that's amazing. It's right here. And I used to, every weekend, ride my bicycle as a nine-year-old around my neighborhood trying to find this school. And you laugh, but this is what I did every weekend, right? Because I wanted to run away to find my superpower. I wanted to find my, my friends, right, where I fit in. And I'm telling this to the chairman of Fox, and he's like, Jim, I didn't know you like superheroes. You want to go to Comic-Con. Now, raise your hand if you know what Comic-Con is. OK, so I'm like, when is it? It's, he's like, today, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And I'm like, I go from a 9-year-old to a 99-year-old. I think, oh, I have all these meetings in LA. How am I going to get to San Diego? There's all these you know, traffic, and I have nothing to wear, all these lines. I don't have a ticket, right? We talk our way out of this stuff. And he's like, Jim, do you want to go? I'm going tomorrow. I'm like, oh, yeah, CEO of Fox is going. I'm going to go with you, right? So he picks me up the next morning, Saturday, 8 AM, from my hotel. And instead of driving, we get on his plane. And no, that's not it. Watch this. On the plane is the entire cast of X-Men. They are going to surprise Comic-Con with the cast, right? 
And I, and I don't even see like Hugh Jackman and Patrick Stewart. I see Professor X, Wolverine, right? And I'm sitting between Jennifer Lawrence and Holly Berry going to Comic-Con, right? Um, and that was, that's a story on its own. But we come back to LA, and the chairman's like, how was your day? I was like, the best day ever. Thank you so much. He's like, Jim, I have something else for you. I'm like, I don't want anything else. What can I do for you? He was like, Jim, they really loved you. How would you like to go on set? I was like, what do you mean? He's like, we have another 30 days of filming the new X-Men movie in Montreal. How would you like to go? I'm like, oh, I totally want to do that, but what can I do for you? He's like, just do what you did for us. Share your superpowers. Teach them how to speed read scripts. Be present, focus on set. Memorize their lines faster. Retain it and everything. I'm like, I could totally do that. And um, the next morning, Sunday, we're on the X-Jet. They call it the X-Jet. We're flying from LA to Montreal. And I'm brain training my superheroes, right? We land, and the very first scene that they're filming takes place in the X-Men school. And I literally, as a nine-year-old, got to see my superheroes come to life, right? And right, I mean, I, I get goosebumps. I call them truth bumps, right? Because I think your, your, your gut, your body knows things. But if we could show, the, and when I get back to New York, I open up my uh, package, and there's a package waiting for me. It's this photo right here. Um, it's a photo of, um, of a whole bunch of people <laughs> when, it, when it goes on. Um, I open it up, and it's me and the entire cast of X-Men like literally the entire cast of X-Men. And even better than this, this photo was the note in, in that came with it. It makes me like kind of tear up even thinking about it. It said this, it was from the chairman. It said, Jim, thank you so much for sharing your superpowers with all of us. I know you've been looking for your superhero school since you were a child. Here's your class photo. And it just, it just blew my mind, right? I mean, just talking from a leadership standpoint in terms of what's really possible. Um, this cover photo is actually my Facebook and my Twitter photo, so you can actually pull it up on your phone, um, at Jim Quick. But it's like literally, but what, what I realized at this time, the reason I'm here with you is, is this, is that um, when I started teaching this in college, um, one of my very first students, she read 30 books in 30 days. Can you imagine that? Could you imagine being able to read 30 books in 30 days, be able to retain it and understand it all? I wanted to find out not how she did it. I wanted to know why, right? Why did why'd she do it? Motivation, right? Going back to motivation. And I found out that it was because her mother was dying of terminal cancer and was given 60 days to live, two months to live. And the books she was reading were books to save her mom's life, right? And I wished her luck, say prayers. Six months later, I get a call from this young lady. Um, I get a call from this young lady, and she's crying and crying and crying. And I find out their tears of joy that her mother not only survived, but is really getting better. Doctors don't know how, they don't know why. They called it a miracle. But her mother attributed 100% to the great advice she got from her daughter, who learned it from all these books. And that's where I realized in that moment that if knowledge is power, learning is your superpower. If knowledge is power, learning is your superpower. I get quoted on this more than anything on social media. I compare your life to an egg. That if an egg is broken by an outside force, life ends, right? If, a life, if, if an egg is broken by an outside force, life ends. If it's broken by an inside force, life begins, right? All great things begin on the inside. And you have greatness inside of you. And you have genius inside of you. And now is the time to let it out. Thank you very much.